Well, thank you so much, Paul. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, and, and I have to throw some accolades back at, at Paul. Uh, he is really uh, a leader in the field. It's, there are a few people in political science who you can say if, if they didn't exist, a whole field might die, and that's uh, Paul Gronke. And so uh, we, we need him nationally if, uh, you know, right now more than ever, especially in this month before uh, the election as uh, early voting gets underway where he's been a, a, a researcher and thought leader for so much, for so long. When I was the research director of the President's Commission on Election Administration, this was the commission that President Obama put together to deal with long lines on Election Day as well as a host of other issues dealing with um, uh, election administration. We turned to Paul for so many of the areas that were uh, of interest to the commission. Uh, I wear a lot of different hats. Uh, I sometimes, you know, I'm, I'm a law professor as, as uh, Paul mentioned, I'm a political scientist, um, I'm a lawyer who advocates uh, for different positions. I, I sometimes say you can tell which one I am because if I'm a political scientist, I have data without opinions. If I'm a law professor, I have opinions without data. And if I'm a lawyer, well, it depends who the client is. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to show lots of those different hats when I talk about uh, the, the topic I'm talking about today. And I also have to say... <laughs> something that a lot of us who work in the field of election administration and, and, and regulation of democracy have to say, particularly at this point of time, at a point in time in American politics, which is that um, I often think that our role and our uh, uh, sort of the, the, our function is similar to uh, sort of an anthropologist who studies human cannibalism, which is that at a certain point, those of us specializing in elections have to replace normal human impulses of disgust and revulsion and replace them with fascination and curiosity. And that's sort of the approach that I'm going to take in, in talking. That doesn't mean that I don't have strong normative commitments uh, on some of these areas, and we can talk about them. You heard from Paul some of the positions I've taken before the Supreme Court and, and um, in advocacy work. But I'm going to talk about the, the changes that are happening in American political campaigning and why I think they're, they're not getting the attention that they deserve and that uh, we, we need to start uh, really thinking about them because it's going to, uh, uh, there's going to be some serious changes in the, in the coming years. Um, so the title of this talk is The Campaign Revolution Will Not Be Televised, The Legal Implications of Politics on Demand. I'm going to talk about changes in technology, changes in politics, and to some extent, changes in the law. Now, just to, to give you the roadmap of where we're going to go, this. Um, how many of you heard of, have heard of Citizens United versus FEC? How many of you agree with the result in that case? I don't think I see one. I mean, I think I saw half a hand. Um, um, I'm going to, yes, that's right. Uh, it's, that's what, it's chilling effect on speech. Um, I'm going to talk about Citizens United, and I'm going to try to convey to you that Citizens United is a case about something that really hasn't been discussed in relation to Citizens United, that um, the, the way that we've thought about that case as a uh, case that gave personhood to corporations is really not the most significant part of that case, and that we ha need to think about Citizens United in the context of changing political communication. Uh, secondly, um, campaign finance law, and obviously uh, Citizens United is, is the most important campaign finance case in, in a generation. Campaign finance law has been preoccupied with television, okay? And that's all going to change very soon. Right. And to the extent campaign finance law has been about um, the inundation and the saturation of 30-second ads, that's a time-bound phenomenon which will uh, soon be changing. Right. And um, we will see this in the advent of internet-based campaign speech, you're already seeing it uh, now, as well as the shift in what your television actually is as a device, which I'll talk about in a second. Fourth, as we move from uh, television, traditional television, broadcast or linear programming to on-demand programming and, and, and political campaigning through the internet, it becomes extremely difficult for government to regulate it, okay? As a result, the main campaign finance regulators in this new world, in the new environment, I mean, let, let's, let's, let me also say something that's obvious, which is it's very difficult for the government to regulate anything in campaign finance this, these days because the Federal Election Commission is an institution that's designed to fail. But besides that, 
um, even though they have difficulty regulating in, in the traditional areas, it becomes even more difficult when you start talking about regulating the internet. And now if that's true, uh, the future of campaign regulation is actually going to be in the hands of many of the major portals like Facebook, Google, and the uh, folks who are my neighbors in Silicon Valley. And we, they need to start thinking about themselves uh, in that kind of public spirited role. And we need to start thinking about them as having that kind of political power. Okay? All right. So let me, if you haven't actually seen the movie, which was at issue in Citizens United, I thought I would play a little bit of it for you right now. This is just the trailer of, uh, the, of the movie called Hillary the Movie, which was the issue in Citizens United. Oh. The problem with nostalgia is what we tend to do is you only remember what you like. And you write, and you forget the parts that you didn't like. I can support the president. I can support an action against Saddam Hussein. If I had been president in 2003, I never would have started this war. Well, she's flipping, she's flopping. No, she's not flipping and flopping. She's lying. My plan does not create a single new government department, agency, or bureaucracy. That's what God put them on the earth to do, is make promises they can't keep. I'm going to take $10 billion away from a lot of these uh, industries. Hillary is really the closest thing we have in America to a European socialist. Oh, isn't that amazing? Oh, it's a woman. She can walk and talk. She is steeped in controversy, steeped in sleaze. Hillary Clinton, I know, is not equipped, not qualified to be our commander in chief. The bigger this campaign is, the bigger the choice is, the more trouble she's in. We must never underestimate this woman. We must never understate her chances of winning. And we must never forget the fundamental danger that this woman poses to every value that we hold dear. You see, I know her. So let the conversation begin. I have a feeling it's going to be very interesting. And that was just the trailer. OK. so. Uh, what Citizens United did was, Citizens United is a nonprofit uh, corporation that re accepts some money from for-profit uh, corporations. It ran this movie on demand, just like you know HBO On Demand or another kind of on-demand movie that you could download at home. Um, it also distributed on, on CDs, DVDs. And um, it did it within 30 days of the 2008 primary season right, of, of uh, when, when Hillary Clinton was running against Barack Obama for uh, the presidency. As a result, it ran afoul of the McCain-Feingold law, right? The McCain-Feingold law, otherwise known as the Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act, said that you could not broadcast a communication um, to the relevant electorate within 30 days of a primary or 60 days of a general election. Uh, when I say you, a corporation couldn't use its treasury funds uh, to, to broadcast uh, a communication that referred to a clearly identified candidate for public office. Okay? It refers to Hillary Clinton. She's a candidate on the ballot. It was available nationwide. Okay? And so therefore, the FEC prevented the movie from uh, being aired. They go to court, uh, and you know the result here, which is that the Supreme Court then struck down not just the law as it applied to, say, on-demand movies, but it applied to, uh, as it applies to all corporate and union uh, treasury fund expenditures in relation to an election. So that so long as a corporation or union independently spends its money, um, that is constitutionally protected according uh, to the Supreme Court. Now, there were many ways the Supreme Court could have not avoided that sort of uh, big kahuna kind of uh, decision, right? It could have uh, just said that, well, it's limited to on-demand movies. I mean, let's face it, right? The law, the bit, what's called BICRA, Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act or McCain-Feingold, is not about someone putting up a movie, right, on demand that you could download. It's for the most part, about 30-second ads, right? That's when you think about campaign spending. And the lion's share of uh, media expenditures, when I say lion's share, over 80%, right, of, of media expenditures are uh, on television ads. 
that's what you're thinking about. But they strategically came up with a way to challenge this law, and they, and they did it through an on-demand movie. Um, and the statute, right, which covers broadcast cable or satellite communications, right, um, you could have said, well, look, as applied to this, this is a kind of constitutional lawyer's trick, you said, as applied to a movie, it's okay, um, but we're going to keep the, the basic statute in place. Um, and uh, the Supreme Court, in, its, uh, in a five to four decision, um, discusses in passing issues about new media, which are going to be the subject of, of this talk, but it's really not the central way that you've come to understand this case, right? And what I want to argue is that Citizens United is in some ways a case before its time, which is that it is really a case about the future of political communication, right? And we need to start thinking about what happens when linear programming diminishes in importance and on-demand and internet uh, uh, communication rises in importance. Now, the first step to this argument is that is to, to convey that so much of the way we have thought about campaign finance regulation is about television ads. Now, I might not need to convince you of that since you, you know, you, you've seen it yourself, which is that so much of the spending and the spending problem is through the inundation right, of you as viewers less so in Oregon than, say, in you know, Ohio right now or Florida, um, but that the inundation of the uh, viewers by uh, money that's being spent uh, in relation to an election. Right? We have it uh, in the case law itself. I put up a quote here from Justice Stevens in, a, in his dissent in a case called Randall versus Sorrell, where he says, just as a driver need not use a Hummer to reach her destination, so a candidate need not flood the airways with ceaseless sound bites of trivial information in order to provide others with reasons to support her. Um, now, a lot of the reasons that we have treated campaign uh, spending on TV differently than other types of campaign spending is because we view the audience as captive, right? We think of the airwaves as the public trust. We uh, also think about the limited spectrum that uh, uh, has traditionally been accorded uh, to television, especially broadcast, right? But all that's going to change, right? And so one of the things, so one of the, the areas of Citizens United that often gets overlooked is this colloquy. I'm going to play about five minutes of it because I think it's, it, it really does highlight the issues at the crux of Citizens United from the perspective that I'm going to try and um, uh, uh, put out there. And so what I, the, the, the section of the oral argument in Citizens United that I'm going to play for you has to do with um, uh, how far the government's theory about corporate spending should go? How far should, should it extend to other kinds of media? Let me see if I can do this. What you're going to hear first is, this is up here, uh, the acting, or the Deputy Solicitor General Malcolm Stewart, Chief Justice Roberts, Justice Sam Alito, uh, are, are a part of this coll colloquy. Oops. As applied to those advertisements, because those advertisements certainly would be susceptible of a reasonable construction. Do you think other than the Constitution required Congress to draw the line where it did, limiting this to broadcast and cable and so forth? <clears throat> What's your answer to Mr. Olson's point that <clears throat> uh, there isn't any constitutional difference between the distribution of this movie on video demand and? Uh, providing access on the Internet, providing DVDs, either through a commercial service or maybe in a public library, providing the same thing in a book. Would the Constitution permit the restriction of all of those as well? I think the constant Constitution would have permitted Congress to apply the electioneering communication restrictions to the extent that they're otherwise constitutional under Wisconsin right to life. Those could have been applied to additional media as well. And it's worth remembering that the pre-existing Federal Election Campaign Act restrictions on corporate electioneering, which have been limited by this Court's decisions to express advocacy. That's pretty incredible. You think that if, if uh, a book was published, uh, a campaign biography that was the functional equivalent of express advocacy, uh, that could be banned? I'm not saying it could be banned. I'm saying that Congress could prohibit the use of corporate treasury funds and could require a corporation to uh, publish it using it, its Well, most act. publishers are corporations. Uh, 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 and a, corpor a publisher that is a corporation could be prohibited from selling a book? Well, of course, the, the statute 
contains its own media exemption for media. But I'm not asking what the statute says. The government's position is that the First Amendment allows uh, the banning of a book if it's published by a corporation. Be- because the First Amendment refers both to freedom of speech and of the press, there would be a potential argument that media corporations, the institutional press, would have a greater First Amendment right. That, that uh, question is obviously not presented here. That the other two things well, Suppose would, it were an advocacy organization that had a book. Your position is that under the Constitution, uh, the advertising for this book or the sale for the book itself could be prohibited within the 60, 90 day period, uh, 60, the 30 day period. If the book contained the functional equivalent of express advocacy, that is, if it was subject to no reasonable interpretation. And, and I suppose it could even, is it the Kindle where you can read, read a book? I, I take it that's from a satellite, so the existing statute would probably prohibit that under your view. Well, the statute applies to cable satellite and broadcast communications. And the, the Court in McConnell has addressed this so question. Just, just to make it clear, it's the government's position that under this statute, if the, this, this Kindle device where you can read a book, which is campaign advocacy, uh, within the 60, 30-day period, if it comes from a satellite, it's under, it can be prohibited under the Constitution and perhaps under the statute. It, it can't be prohibited, but a corporation could be barred from using its general treasury funds to publish the book. It could be required to use, to raise funds to publish the book uh, using its PAC. If it but has again, one name, one use of the candidate's name, it would be covered, correct? That's if it's a 500-page book and at the end it says, and so vote for X, the government could ban that. Well, if it says vote for X, it would be express advocacy, and it would be covered by the pre-existing Federal Election Campaign Act. It seems no, I'm talking get out of about this. under the Constitution, what we've been discussing, if it's a book. If it's a book and it is produced, uh, again, to leave, to leave to one side the question of Right, right. Forget the possible media right. ex- exemption. If you had Citizens United or General Motors using general treasury funds to publish a book that said at the outset, for instance, Hillary Clinton's election would be a disaster for no, no, the Take my hypothetical. It doesn't say at the outset. It runs here is a whatever it is. This is a discussion of the um, uh, American political system, and at the end it says vote for X. Yes, our position would be that the corporation could be required to use PAC funds rather than general treasury And if they didn't, you could ban it? If they didn't, we could prohibit the publication of the book using the corporate treasury fund. Okay, so uh, if you learn nothing else, uh, right, as I teach my First Amendment students, if you're arguing before the Supreme Court, try not to be on the side of book banning, uh, because that's pretty much a surefire way that you're going to lose the case. Uh, I won't play, I, I, if we have time, I'll play the second clip, which is that that colloquy actually led to the Supreme Court ordering a re-argument in Citizens United on the basic question of whether corporations, uh, uh, electioneering communications were protected under the First Amendment, where uh, then Solicitor General Elena Kagan uh, almost got away without having to answer the question, but uh, Justice Ginsburg asked her, said, well, what, and, and I can play this for you later, what, you know, uh, what was your answer to uh, the question that was raised in the first oral argument? And then that also went down the rabbit hole where uh, they, and she says, well, our position has changed. And then there's laughter in the courtroom and, and, and the rest is history. Um, but that colloquy really does focus uh, us on the question as to whether television is a special medium when it comes to campaign and electioneering activity, right? Um, and as I said before, the theories as to why it is uh, focus on whether the airwaves are a public trust, whether there's limited spectrum space, whether there's a captive audience, um, but also concerns, as Justice Stevens expressed, about uh, political advertising on TV in particular, the tone of, of it, what a corrosive effect on democracy. Maybe it's because people view it as especially effective, though there's a considerable debate about that among political scientists as to whether, say, the $200 million that Hillary Clinton has spent on ads has actually done much for her, um, as well as the idea that, that maybe uh, uh, this type of TV advertising is manipulative and, and characteristically negative. Okay. So, so much of, of uh, campaign finance law has been about television, and so now what's about to happen? And when I say what's about to happen, I don't want to suggest that it's, we're seeing the seeds of it in this election. Okay, It is still the case 
that most Americans watch four hours of television a day, okay, and that's not even, that's not on-demand television, that's, that's linear programming, um, that you who are, who are undergraduates here watch less, and so one should expect that that's going to happen uh, in, the, in the future, that it'll, 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 will be declining. But here's what we mean when we talk about the move from television to the internet, because it's not just that you, you're changing devices, right? Uh, yes, it's true, we're talking about uh, uh, other types of screens that you'll be watching, whether it's your phone, tablet, computer, or gaming device. I don't know if you saw on the first slide, and I'll bring it up later, that one of the things that we've noticed is that um, uh, President Obama in his re-election campaign actually embedded ads in video games, in online video games like Madden Football and some of these racing games. Uh, so there's all these different devices, but it's not just that, it's also that television itself will just be one more screen right, on which, um, uh, which serves as a platform for, uh, for broadcasting uh, and uh, different types of programming, right? And so it's the decline in linear programming to politics on demand. Um, and in particular, that uh, the key difference is uh, targeting, right? That the capacity to go after individuals based on information that we know about you from your browsing history and everything else, your entire behavior online, really does set the internet apart as a medium and that we can um, uh, target, we being the campaigns can, can target you individually. Um, I'll say one thing, it, it's one of the things that makes this challenging is to try to describe the types of communications that we're talking about, right? Because it's not the replication of a television ad online, right? You know this if you've you know, been interacting on Facebook uh, uh, with candidates or the like, or if you, there's a cookie in your browser that um, uh, knows that you visited the Bernie Sanders webpage or something like that. That it's uh, banner ads, it's search histories, it's the news you receive on Facebook. It is, um, uh, like I said, embedded ads in video games. It's all kinds of ways that communication can get to you um, through the internet and through these uh, different platforms. And the challenge is once we recognize how complicated this new communication environment is, it's going to be extremely difficult for government to regulate it. Okay, and I, I don't want to um, um, suggest that that's a, a lamentation, that you know, government should regulate the internet. I'm just saying that, that this is the nature of the beast right now. That when you talk about communication moving online away from a privileged device like television and a limited spectrum space, that it becomes very difficult for the government to regulate it. Um, there are currently uh, limited existing regulations when it comes to internet communication. There's some disclosure regulations, but they're very weak. Second, the, the Federal Election Commission had to, uh, did try to grapple with updating regulations for the internet, and it caused maybe the biggest controversy over the last eight to 10 years. Uh, it paralyzed the FEC, well, the FEC is always paralyzed, but the FEC could not, um, uh, th this is what then led to the sort of famous controversies that they couldn't even agree on whether they were gonna have donuts or bagels at the meeting, because that was, uh, they, they, that would require a bridge too far for them to compromise over. But it, it poisoned relationships on the FEC. I've caps, uh, one, it, they, they leaked it to the Drudge Report. You can see what um, uh, the, the, the headlines were and, and, and also on Fox News. Um, and why is it so difficult to regulate internet campaign uh, communication? Well, these should be obvious, which is that the geographic scope of the World Wide Web, after all, I think of uh, the prototypical 400-pound uh, Trumpian uh, uh, metaphor from last night in his bed in, you know, Madagascar or, or, or Azerbaijan or someplace, right, that is uh, ha putting up a YouTube video for Donald Trump. Uh, you can't... You know, there's nothing the FEC is going to be able to do to, to regulate that. Um, the variety of media, which I described before, um, the difficulty in identifying the source of communications, the, the, the uh, tendency of, uh, to, of the internet to, to privilege uh, anonymity, and the real difficulty of trying to define who the media is in this new environment. Because we all probably agree, right, that you cannot prevent the New York Times Corporation from covering this election. Right? That if the First Amendment means anything, right, you can't prevent news media from mentioning a candidate's name within 30 days of an election or 60 days of an election. That's kind of their, their business model. Right? Uh, and so if that's true, then uh, it becomes extremely difficult to figure out who the media is in this new communication environment when anyone can blog, tweet, or uh, put up a YouTube video. Now, I say that it's difficult 
to regulate the internet. Now, that's not entirely true. There are plenty of countries that do so. And if you go to um, uh, either Google or Twitter's uh, pages that talk about practices, they will give you a list of foreign countries that have certain restrictions. So in Brazil, the promotion of political candidates or parties is not allowed on their platform. In China, well, most everything's prohibited, but, but, but names of state authorities or political personnel, criticism of the Communist Party, Taiwan independence, Tibet independence, Hong Kong Democratic Party, the ride in Tiananmen Square are all prohibited. Indonesia, Japan, Korea. Uh, Korea actually took down, I think it's 20,000 Facebook posts in the run-up to the, their last election. It's a very serious uh, set of rules when it comes to um, uh, regulating online communication, right? Of course, you know, it's, it is a whack-a-mole problem, so that then you end up with real uh, difficulties in trying to, to capture uh, uh, all this communication, but that's the kind of uh, legal regime where uh, uh, it has been successful, um, very different than our First Amendment. Now, why should we be concerned about this new communication environment? If you don't like TV ads, just wait, is, is sort of the, the, the bottom line of this talk. Um, First, the, there is obviously an oligopoly of the major portals. Facebook, uh, you can see this in the effect that Facebook has on, on uh, news consumption and the media in general. Um, that is why the controversy, if you're familiar with the controversy they had in the last year over their trending news uh, feed, has been so important because if you talk to journalists, um, basically Facebook is sort of the coin of the realm right now because so many people get their information, get their news uh, from, from Facebook. Um, and so there's the risk of bias, what Jonathan Zittrain call, at Harvard calls digital gerrymandering, the risk that either through the search engines uh, uh, prioritization or the decisions of the major portals that uh, certain political consequences uh, will follow. Then the more familiar criticisms you get of internet communication, of echo chambers, and of the negativity and tone that you see in any, you know, in the, among trolls of the internet. Uh, and as we said before, uh, uh, the anonymity which is facilitated uh, by the internet. Um, none of this is going to, I mean, but you know, the First Amendment has costs, and a lot of these are, are costs that we see in our everyday life. Right? It's not like anonymity is a unique problem when it comes to uh, internet communication. We have that uh, issue when it comes to pamphlets and the like. We've actually protected the uh, right to, of anonymous pamphleteers. Um, but what does set, as I said before, the internet apart is this capacity to marry all these other pathologies that, that seem to be exacerbated online with the capacity to target you individually, okay? Because the amount of information that is available to the portals and to anyone who's willing to exploit it uh, to then target you with specific information. And so, uh, here, so we have government being less effectual in their ability to regulate increasing challenges, I'd say even dangers, in, in this brave new world of political communication. Opportunities as well, which I'll get to at the end, because of course, one of the benefits, uh, this sort of the utopian view of the internet, of course, is that it's cheap, right? That you can reach a mass audience with, with very little uh, money. And so there is obviously a cost and benefit uh, side to this. But the major portals do play an extremely important role in regulating um, the amount, the information as it is sent to you. Now, I'm particularly concerned here with paid, if, if, since this is focusing on campaign finance, I'm focusing on paid political communication, right? And, and for reasons that, that uh, should be obvious, right? Which is that if the campaign finance problem is often sort of the replication of economic inequality in the political sphere, right? And so how will, uh, these new portals enable the kind of um, uh, inequality that we've seen uh, in the campaign finance system already. One thing I want to disabuse you of at the, at the outset, so before I talk about why I think um, these portals should be self-regulating in, in important ways, is that non, a kind of laissez-faire, non-regulatory environment is not a possibility. It's not going to happen. The question for the future is whether the same kinds of regulations that these corporations have for regulating the advertising of soap and other products online are going to be the same regulations that apply to politics, okay? They already regulate, to a considerable extent, the kind of communication that goes on online, both sometimes um, free communication, sometimes paid communication. So you can see, and this is uh, from YouTube, right, that they have a set of um, 
uh, rules about privacy, about hateful content, right? Hate speech is prohibited on all the platforms where you, where you look at um, uh, 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 Facebook, uh, Twitter, Google, and the like, right? You might wonder, well, how does that dovetail with certain comments in, say, a, a presidential campaign? But, but they, they, and they've actually had to grapple with that. Um, threats, uh, uh, sexual content, so obscenity. Really interesting fact about how, the, how do they police all of this? Well, to some extent, they, if you, you can notify Facebook or, or Google of, of these problems, sometimes the bots themselves or the, the, the algorithms police it. So there are certain words you can't put into a Twitter post, right? Certain racial epithets and the like, uh, as well as obscene language. Um, some t now, what, one of the things that's happened with some of the platforms is now, say, with obscenity, with images, that they've actually adopted machine learning and put it into the programs. So as the, 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 the algorithm uh, continuously has to deal with these questions of what's obscene and what's not and whether they're going to take it down, it's now actually the case that um, the computer knows it when it sees it, right? Uh, we, and, uh, and that the rules that apply to obscenity actually are ones that are incapable of human definition, okay? And so, uh, it's, you know, for those of us who study the First Amendment, this is like a fascinating uh, problem, right? Um, and then a whole series of other uh, issues dealing with misrepresentation, uh, violent or graphic material, as well as you can't sell certain things like guns on, on some of these portals or drugs and the like. All right. And so now what we're left with, if, I don't th if, the, if the FEC is not going to be able to regulate this area, if it's simply too complicated and the portals are regulating it anyway, uh, we need to start thinking about what are the right ways for these new private regulators of campaign finance. Now, you might say, and I want to grant this up front, um, well, why would they want to limit the amount of money that some campaign is going to spend online? And so, of course, let's just concede that at the outset, um, that this is only to the extent that it's consistent with their business model, right? And obviously, they don't want, they don't want to turn away money, um, uh, all other things being equal. But as a share of the total amount of ad revenue, let me tell you that these portals are getting, political ads are a tiny, tiny slice. And it's actually more important, and I say this as someone who resides in Silicon Valley and talks to them, it's more important for, even from their perspective to get this problem right than it is to uh, get the, the hundreds of millions that might actually go to one portal or another, okay? And, and so what does it mean to get this problem right? And so for the first thing, uh, if you are with me that targeting is the main concern and that some of these other uh, uh, issues dealing with um, the pathologies of the internet have to be addressed, is I think the lowest hanging fruit here is to, for these portals to start requiring robust disclosure, even more than the kind of disclosure that is um, required under federal law. One of the things that's enabled by the internet is the ability to um, not just have an ad that says paid for by Americans for America, right, but you could actually have a link that goes to the individuals who are behind that kind of, that kind of ad, right? Um, Second, people need to start thinking, of the, and the portals need to start thinking about the common questions that we've been dealing with in campaign finance law. Should they be treating, you know, how are they going to deal with spending by foreign nationals, by, um, by uh, uh, corporations, by other um, uh, entities that are, have been regulated by uh, federal law? As well as issues dealing with misrepresentation, uh, tone, and fairness, of course, we should all be concerned, even if, if the answer to these questions is that they should step out of this and that Facebook, as it's learned in its newsfeed editing, should not be in the business of trying to figure out what is sort of appropriate or fair political content. Um, they need to state that up front. And we need to know what their uh, actual policies are with regard to political advertising. And uh, they need to be transparent about how much is being spent on their portals and, and what their uh, sort of standards have been. But as I said, and let me just reiterate this, the idea that they're going to step out of the way is not an option. They are already regulating this, and we just don't know to what extent. And so uh, right now, as we are at the beginning of this revolution in uh, campaign uh, communication, they need to start thinking about themselves uh, uh, almost as quasi-government actors who are going to be, going to be in the main uh, role here. Uh, at the end of this article that, that is, the, is the subject of this talk, I talk about a, a sort of grand bargain here um, that the, the, the portals can offer 
the uh, political actors, whether it's political parties or uh, campaigns. And that is that, in exchange, that sort of with great power comes great responsibility, the Spider-Man principle, which is that if you are going to enable individual level targeting, and it is now the case on Facebook, if I have your email address or if I have a whole group of email addresses, I can address um, specific targeting to you uh, uh, that would not be seen by someone else. And I can, you know, have uh, information about uh, all kinds of aspects of your life that, that I could feed into um, the database that, that I would use toward targeting. And so um, as, the, as we move toward this kind of individualized, targeted uh, environment, uh, the, the, uh, the portals need to start thinking about how they are going to regulate uh, in the classic way that, that uh, campaign finance regulators have. Now, I want to end, because I can't give a talk on politics without at least you know, talking about what's on all of your minds, because this, for all of you who've been fretting since last night, uh, it's you know, beside the point. And so I love this cartoon, right? A group of elephants around the table saying, it's time to talk about the Trump in the room. Um, and so let me, let, me, let me just say, well, what is, uh, the, because this is sort of orthogonal to, to the Trump phenomenon, um, but, but I want to talk a little bit about um, uh, the internet in the 2016 campaign. And as I said before, there are good news and bad news stories here about what's happened in the 2016 campaign. On the one hand, um, what Trump has shown, and others as well, Bernie Sanders to some extent, though a lot of his story is, is um, typical, uh, it's sort of the next generation after Howard Dean and Barack Obama in terms of fundraising online, but that you can run a competitive campaign right through the internet uh, cer or certain types of politicians can, certain types of actors are, are able to do so uh, with low cost, right? Um, uh, is a different type of campaign, allows the, the uh, candidates to speak directly uh, to the voters uh, in ways that uh, were not possible when you were living in a televised uh, environment, when you had to go through media, um, or the established media. One thing we've learned from the Trump phenomenon, right, because in some ways his story and his use of Twitter is not the story that I'm telling today, right, which is about the use of money, right, to, to buy advertising, but that what he has successfully sort of cracked the code on is in trying to figure out uh, how to use his Twitter account and use new media to set the agenda for legacy media, right, and to um, bring, you know, the networks uh, to gain their attention by what he does online. But we've seen the dystopian part of this as well, right? Whether it's the tone of this campaign or the, um, the, the tendency of uh, the internet to foster untrue uh, beliefs in the mass public and to prize virality over truth, um, as well as uh, earlier concerns about um, polarization and, and tone that we've seen the worst worst of it in this campaign. I don't want to suggest that the internet is solely to blame, but it's exacerbating a lot of these forces which are already sort of subterranean in American politics. And so this is the world we have to look forward to. Um, I can't say that this election is going to be, is going to resemble everything that comes after it, let's hope not. Uh, but that um, we need to start thinking about uh, how this change in technology is going to affect both the political and regulatory environment of campaign communication in the years to come. And with that, I'll take your questions.